Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna start off now. A massive welcome to people uh, joining us live and watching the video or listening to the recording. Um, it's part of the John Cat Authors Podcast. Um, I'm Tom Sherrington, and I'm get the huge privilege of working with Mary Myatt uh, on various events, and I'm absolutely delighted that I'm able to host this chat with her about her fabulous book that's coming out very soon, called Back on Track. And uh, Mary, so welcome to the welcome to the discussion. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, as you say, we do a lot of really great and very amusing work together. So it's great to have the chance to talk to you about uh, the latest iteration of Mary Bart's uh, fluent dribble. Really, <laughs> that's great, uh, Mary. For for people who've, who've never seen Mary talk, I mean, she is fantastic. She has this amazing. She has the audience in the palm of her hand, and she can also pull off this thing of sort of ticking people off in the most fantastic way. So she says things like, um, I, I just don't think it's good enough, colleagues. <laughs> like and everyone's already sort of, you know, in love with what you're saying already. So they, you just go, no, you're right. It isn't good enough. But they people will accept it from you, whereas they wouldn't accept it from someone else, I think. So you have this way of having a bit of steel, but at the same time, you know, this kind of love for everyone and what they're doing. So look, let's, let's just kick off. Why, why have you written this book? And... Um, I know there's a story about around the title, so let's talk about that. What, what's its secret title? And then tell us why you called it, what you have called it. Well, um, I must say, I was, I've been working on it for about 18 months or so. The minute I finish one book, I get the urge to write another. Is that the same for you, actually? Do you find there's a, an ongoing urge to get material out there? Yeah, I like, I mean, I like the whole thing of writing and it's, you have to wait for a good idea to come along. But yeah, I, do, I know what you mean. So I have a stash of stuff I want to write about. And after I'd finished uh, the curriculum, Gallimau Free to Coherence, um, I had been exercised for some time about uh, just some of the practices that I think are pretty redundant in schools. And I'm going to push my neck out here. And I think the education sector as a whole is quite conservative in some of its organisational processes. So not in terms necessarily of pedagogy, not in terms of the work that's going on around uh, proper subject knowledge and curriculum, that sort of thing. But I think some of the stuff that sits around that is, to put it politely, is redundant. So my working title for this um, was actually Cutting the Crap. And when Alex Sherratt was in touch and he said, um, uh, had I got another book on the go? And I said, as it happens, Alex, I have. I said, the working title is Cutting the Crap. Anyway, he sent the contract back with cutting the crap in the title. That was just the working title. So it's a <laughs> ridiculous thing. I've signed contracts there. Well, I blocked it out and then put back on track because it was partly tongue in cheek. And I just thought uh, it was probably just a bit too, uh, a bit too meta, a bit too out there. But so it, the, the thinking really is how we strip out anything that is not serving our core purpose, which is mainly helping children to learn uh, and tr tracking the impact of what we're doing and get short of anything that is not absolutely linked to that core purpose of our work. Well, it's, it's, it's a brilliant uh, idea because it's, it's definitely something everyone who's ever worked in the school experiences and as a school leader it's just so it's just absolutely overwhelming everything you need to do. So the idea that we sort of do fewer things in greater depth which is the kind of the, the it, is a brilliant idea but I, do, I think it's worth getting into the detail of it. So, because it, in a way, when you start listing, I, I, you have this amazing style of having lots of very short chapters. And I th for me, that's brilliant because you sort of, you don't have to read them necessarily in, the, in, a, in order, although you might. You can dive in and zoom around and you feel like you get this hit of, of knowledge or of insight, um, which is it's just very good. I mean, most people write like endless chapters and you do this sort of pump, pump, pump. But it also feels like there's like it's quite a lot of things to then think about. So do you think there's a tension in kind of this sort of listing of lots of ideas at the same time as trying to filter down? Do you know what I mean? It's sort of even thinking about all the things there are to filter out is quite overwhelming. Yes. So I think, yes, there is a tension there. But the point is, there's a lot that needs to be cut back. And the reason I write short chapters is because uh, I can't write long chapters so it's nothing virtuous on my part but I, I do get a lot of lovely feedback people saying yeah I really love your short chapters Mary it means I can dip in and out of the book as you say you find helpful um, but that's basically just the way that I write so 
the, the other thread behind that though is that I believe if you can't distill an important idea to about 750 or a thousand words then you're waffling so that's my view and I think there's an awful lot of books where there's padding around there and redundant clauses and redundant sentences so I like to trim everything back and I chuck a huge amount out because I write very fast um uh, there's probably about at least 30% of the book that never gets to see publication. So um, to, your po to answer your point about, uh, the, you know, the conflict or the tension that there is between having a, a lot of material that needs to be tackled and then also keeping it tight, um, I think that's one of the intellectual um, things that, you know, school leaders have to, have to grapple with. Um, what I would say is, is that, you know, I think I've got to make it clear that the only thing that is absolutely non-negotiable and there's huge amount sitting around it is safeguarding and of course what we're going through at the moment um, in terms of what's happened during lockdown and then um, most children coming back to school and we don't know how for long for as we speak now uh, at the start of the autumn term you know a lot of this the the um, logistics and the operations around that are inevitably going to be taking up leaders and teachers times and governors as well and so I wouldn't for a moment say that that should be cut back um, yeah. and I know from conversations with with heads and leaders you know over the last few months um, they have said it is filling their heads and they're welcoming the chance actually to think about other stuff because it's 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 just been so overwhelming what people have gone through but I think that other stuff the thing that you know the material that I'm talking about that has to take its place in the grand scheme of things it's not something that we tackle immediately now because there is this bigger thing that everyone is coping with yeah for sure the book is going to have a lifetime way beyond the covid i mean we, they'll, they'll be we'll be back into a fairly normal normal both by the time you know and your book will be like totally current so i, I don't think there's any risk of that so there's a couple of people like you, you talk about the pareto principle and um Mc, mccarran's essentialism so these are two ideas which are sort of seem to be related so tell us a bit about that. So the, what, I mean, it's, it's something which people have heard, but how does the Pareto principle, the 80-20, apply to the theme in the book, Back on Track? Yeah, so, so the, there are three, as you say, the Pareto principle, Greg McCown's essentialism, and also Marie Kondo, an unlikely um, guru on which to draw for the educational um, setting. Um, but they've, they've got, they've got th um, things underpinning them that I think are useful for unpacking this notion of what might we strip back? So to take Pareto, who was um, an Italian professor um, of sociology, he was actually working in um, in um, the University of Geneva at the end of the sort of eighteen nineties, and it just so happened he was actually doing research on the land ownership uh, ownership of land in England um, at that time. And what he found was was that eighty percent of the land was owned by twenty percent of the population. And I, it did occur to him, could that, um, could that um, ratio apply to other contexts? But he didn't take it any really much further. But it was then picked up by later on by leadership and management thinkers who actually applied that law across a number of sectors, both in business, in industry, in um, public organisations, in, in you know across across the piece, um, and. You, you know, the, the findings were remarkably consistent that 80% of effective work or output tends to come from 20% of, of inputs. Um, and I don't think that's a hard and fast rule. I think it could be 70, 30. I think the main thing to take from that is to pay great attention to the things that have the greatest impact. And so where I, where I, the argument thread I then take from that is that what do we know our best bets in relation to having the greatest impact for all our children particularly those who are disadvantaged and we know that it's the quality of the curriculum so it's really setting the scene for that because one of my concerns is is that the renewed focus on curriculum quality um, which has gone right up the agenda and it's worth saying at this point plenty of schools have always paid attention to the quality of the curriculum but we know across the sector there's been more work to be done um, yeah. that you know it can't just be dumped on people this is another thing to do 
So if we're going to pay attention to the quality curriculum, what are we going to strip out? So it's using the 80-20 Pareto rule, Greg McCown's essentialism and Mari Kondo's thinking as well, to take a hard look at, for all of us, myself included, what, what is not adding value to my core business? I think that's so interesting. And I, and I have to say, having been a school leader of, you know, I would say of mixed fortunes over the years, I'm guilty of that. I mean, it's so hard. If you sit in a team of people and someone has an idea and you kind of run with it and there's an enthusiasm builds, but you, to have the discipline to say, look, that's going to take away all this energy, this focus. Is it, it's a nice thing. It would be great to happen, but we simply cannot afford the focus to drift from this, however good your idea seems to be. And actually that's, that's not always easy, but it's so important to do, isn't it? I mean, uh, is that, do you come across that challenge for people? Yes. And so what follows from this, the, the, the logic of this way of looking at our work means that there are going to be trade-offs in the way that you've just described. So that is very uncomfortable for everyone, but particularly for those of us in education, because you know, we all work incredibly hard. We all want to do the best for children. And the minute that, you know, there seems the chance to be able to do more, we want to do it. But we can only do that if we chop something else off at the other end. And we've got a greater obligation if we're responsible for that additional workload for people who are in our teams. Um, and so, I, you know, there's all sorts of things that flow from this in terms of workload, in terms of uh, recruitment, retention and all the rest of it. So, it's not a comfortable place to be psychologically, but if we're serious about this, we learn to become comfortable with that discomfort. Yeah, and I, and I think it's a, a really healthy mindset for people to develop, and it's you almost going to sort of take a pride in having not taken that new initiative because you just think, no, I'm going to, I'm going to walk, I'm going to walk around a school, I'm going to just keep focusing on my curriculum development and not do that other thing because like that's the right thing to do. Yeah. So look, I, you, Sorry. It is a really good example of this. I was um, doing, I was recording an interview with Sam Strickland the other day, and he he exemplifies this really well. So you know, he knew when he 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 joined the Dustin School, he wanted to get the culture right first, and that's all they focused on in that year. Second year curriculum third year curriculum allowing this stuff to breathe you know not making up a new initiative because it's a new academic year uh, for their school development plan or school improvement plan whatever they call it and so you know he is he's a great example of someone who's really got an intellectual purchase on this way of working yeah and i, and I, and I find it in in the, my work with sort of teacher development which is the, the kind of need to, it's, it's an interesting challenge of keeping people interested and motivated to carry on, on working on the same stuff. Um, it's so easy to people to say, oh, we've done that last year. <laughs> oh, we did that input last year. And, and as if like now you need another one. But to say, well, no, we're, what we're going to do is this year, we're going to do the same stuff we did last year, but better. Some, for some people, that's a bit, mm, and you have to, you have to you know, sell the idea that it will be better. It's actually really great when you get to the level of doing things that well. So let, yeah. let, I actually want to dive into some of the ideas because I think once we've got this idea that we're stripping stuff out and focusing on really good things, you, you have tons of ideas for good things, which are fantastic. And uh, some of them are really attractive. You've got these great sort of punchy headings, which, which draw you in. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just sample them and get, and get you to tell us a bit about what they mean. So um, creators, not consumers. What's, what's that about? Creators, not consumers. Well, um, I think there's an awful lot of busyness in an awful lot of uh, classroom practice. And, you know, this is never to have a go at anyone. This is just, um, you know, trying to critique what is quite often, um, you know, misplaced uh, understanding of children's learning. So, you know, what I'm really concerned about here is that children complete a lot of work quite often not even second rate, not even third rate worksheets. And for instance, and they, you know, they're stuck then in their books. So what's that about? You know, why are we sticking paper on paper? You know, yeah. what a waste of time. But the children um, are regurgitating what that worksheet has said and what they've been told by the teacher. And so there's no expectation that they create their own ideas or their own insights from it. Now, 
there is a place sometimes of just doing basic stuff. That's really fine. But because they need to know, children need to know stuff. This is where, you know, space practice, retrieval practice, low stakes quizzes are all, are all really helpful. But I would say those are sowing the seeds for children to be able to create something with them. Um, so it's just children are, are, are consuming a lot of stuff that has been given to them, reading PowerPoints, consuming worksheets, not doing any individual thinking on them. Now, what has really made me think about this, just as one example, I'm talking to a child uh, in year four, uh, looking at her English book, a literacy book, some lovely stuff in there. So we had good chat about what she'd been doing. But I noticed a few lessons before she'd done some work on homophones. Um, and so I should assume she'd learned about homophones because she'd completed a worksheet. It had been ticked off, smiley face by the teacher, no doubt sitting on some spreadsheet, having turned it green for that KPI. So I assumed she'd learned it. So I said to her, oh, homophones, those are interesting. What have you learned about homophones? And this child couldn't say because there had been nothing that she'd been expected to do to create with it, to do anything with it. She had just had it to complete that sheet. sheet. Bright little thing. You know, it wasn't that she couldn't have done more. She wasn't expected to do more. So it's, it's this, are we really making children think yeah. and do something on their own terms virtually all the time? That's so interesting. Uh, that, that links to, I, I saw talking to, uh, on another thing, talking to Mark McCourt yesterday about maths. And he has this thing in his teach, do, practice, behave model, where the behave, behaving like a mathematician. And I was asking him whether it sort of, whether it comes at the end. And he said, no, it's sort of, it's something you should be doing all the way along, behaving like a mathematician, sort of doing maths. Um, and doing maths means thinking about ideas, embracing confusion, embracing the difficulty of not knowing what the answer is and all these things. That's how mathematicians behave. And I like, that sounds similar, sort of not just repeating the procedure and being functionally fluent in a procedure. It's thinking like a mathematician, learning yeah. to ask questions. That's fascinating. And I, I, I totally get what you mean. I mean, and that is a spirit, isn't it, in a school where you have to encourage teachers to allow that. What, what about then, um, that links into something else where you, there's, there are two different chapters and I was wondering whether these things are sort of, they're not at odds, they aren't, but they're, they're, they're difficult to get right. One of them is about differentiation, which you kind of want to sort out. And, the other, and then you talk about giving kids work above their pay grade. So, <laughs> so talk us through that kind of challenge about, that, about stretching kids above their pay grade, but then differentiation being something you teachers wrestle with. Yeah, so um, yeah, differentiation really needs to be nailed in a coffin and, you know, buried. So it started off with good intentions, no question about it, about making sure that the material that was offered to children um, was available to them, accessible to them. But it got degraded into, and it's still going on, there's a Twitter conversation the other day about almost and some. Um, someone was asking newly qualified teachers on Twitter, do they need to differentiate their learning in outcomes or learning intentions or learning objectives? And I was delighted to see quite a few people saying, well, why would you? Yeah, great. Why would you? Because what you're doing there, you know, the, the bog standard understanding of differentiation although it's well-intentioned of almost and some, what you're saying is, is that, it, it, um, it, well, the consequences of it, well, I'll say what it is, is that you get some children who actually could achieve much higher, but they don't because all they've done is the sum. You know, well, mm. I've done what was expected of me. And so, you know, that, technically the teacher hasn't got a leg to stand on <laughs> because yeah, everyone's done the sum, even though a child could have done more. But even more worrying is that there are some children who will never get beyond the sum and they'll never be given uh, the, addition, the additional stretch. And so, and quite often that almost and sum is different activities, not actually linked to the corpo. So it's a lot of extra work for teachers and essentially it's putting limits on children's learning. So that is why I'm really allergic to uh, differentiation because I think the damage it does to children. By contrast, giving children stuff above their pay grade, um, all the evidence is, is that children love doing difficult stuff. They really enjoy having stuff that they know 
is beyond what they might be expected to do. So Alison Peacock's great work, um, Assessment for Learning Without uh, Limits, which came out in 2015, really great vignette in there where she and a colleague are interviewing some children as they go from year five into year six and um, trying to tease out what the children thought, think about ability tables. Um, now that's a separate issue which I'm not going to touch on here but the way the children respond it's about provision and the quality of provision. So the high, the high tables are delighted because they get the really interesting work. The middle tables like the sound of it but they of the high work they're not given it but they realize they'll never get it because there are only six seats on the top table and the the bottom groups are just um you know despondent and and lack all motivation they too would like the sound of the difficult work but they are always given the least work so you've got that on one level and my own work interviewing students um with um for homework being given in geography um articles to read from the national geographic in year nine teacher telling them that this is difficult, they're to read it for homework, but it doesn't matter it's difficult because they're going to talk about what they did do and didn't do, uh, uh, understand at the start of the next lesson. And then the final example in this, Richard Kennett's work um, in history, um, testing out the scholarship reading mm. homework um, for year seven, where they're given extracts, they're learning about the Norman Conquest and 1066, they're given extracts from Mark Morris's account of the Norman Conquest, and they're asked to analyze it. And the start of the of the introduction to it, Richard says to them, um, read these extracts, answer all the questions. This is supposed to be hard. So if you can't answer them all, don't worry. Okay, so what, what children really, and they, then they all have a try. They all have a crack at it, even children with a reading age below 10. Um, so as long as the conditions are right, characterized by high challenge and low threat, children love doing stuff that is above their pay grade. So, um, and the final, the final example I've put into that is the um, faster reading research, which came out of Sussex University last year, where um, students in year eight, it was only a small trial, so there's probably more work to do around it. But what they found, I think, is we can't ignore, they found that those um, children in year eight were given um, two novels to read as a whole class, um, at least a year above what they'd normally be studying. And uh, what they found was, that's all they did for 12 weeks was they read and talked about those two novels and what they found was that by the end of those 12 weeks on average the reading scores had improved by eight and a half months the low prior attainers by 16 and a half months wow so you can't we can't ignore this kind of research now the the paper that goes with it two really interesting things in there first is when they talk to the children about the the poorer poorer readers about why they'd done so well they said well we just got into the material. We didn't need to understand every word. The fact we were getting into it, we just wanted to read on. We wanted to find out more. So you've yeah. got this internal motivation of children are successful quite early on. But the second insight, and I think we all need to have a word with ourselves, is that the teachers were surprised at how well these kids did. So let's, let's stop big surprise let's just expect expose them to all this if it's really too hard we just find something else you know it's not the end of the world nobody's going to die but actually really stretch yeah. where we can and ideally go back to the source material in every subject i can talk about that a bit that, later that, that links back into the the creators as well so you know that thing of having to use the knowledge it's interesting though because i do think so i do think there are competing pressures and people need to sort of work their way around this so one of the sort of things that people pick up on is, you know, that knowledge is important to unlock reading. So often our reading problems are knowledge problem. But at the same time, you can't literally teach every word in advance of kids encountering it in a text. Um, so you do need to learn to read words, text with words you don't know and not to panic and kind of then work out, you know, you do need that or else you'd never get anywhere. We all do that. So I do think those things are some, not contradictory, but they, they, there's a subtle interplay between those pre-teaching knowledge and learning to teach work, you know, above your pay grade, if you like. Le learn, yeah, and that's where work. Isabel Beck's work is really good, um, bringing words to life. And also, of course, Alex Quigley's closing the vocabulary gap, closing the re reading gap. They've got great strategies for that. Um, but I'm going to be relaxed about the fact that my kids will not know every word in advance. So I might pre-teach some of it, but it doesn't matter if they don't, because guess what? We stop and talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what teaching is. <laughs> yeah, that's true. 
I, I also think there's a thing, it's so interesting because I do think it's just, this is the real life of teachers that it's, it is e difficult. So what, what Mark was saying yesterday to me about maths was, you know, the simple idea that you find out what the kids don't know and teach them that is really, really powerful in maths because if a found, it's, it's totally hierarchical. And if you haven't, it's like, it's, like a, it's like a constant, you know, one of those Tetris games, unless you're filling in the, the you just can't build. Yeah. So with that, in, so what, but then what you, you get divergence in a group and that is challenging so you've got some kids who still haven't picked up and others who have so you do get this divergence and you can't just say well i'm sorry guys we're going at this pace and you just it's tough you do have to keep teaching them the things they don't know and that is that isn't easy well look that i i'm gonna i want to I, I could talk about <laughs> each chapter for about an hour um i'm gonna pick up on a question because as it's come up and it's good to have the interactivity here so somebody's asked us a question on the chat here which says um they started at a new school uh, responsible for, for the sixth form, essentially, Key Stage 5. Used to be head of department. But they, there's a new school, and they're not, they're not delighted with the curriculum. So um, what, what should a new member of staff do? do you, um, is it a time to be quiet and listen, or should you, they be assertive and challenge what is there? <laughs> what do you think about that? Um, I, I, I'm a great believer in listening and talking and scoping the terrain first so that you've got you've got a lot of evidence um, to to back up an argument if you want things to be ramped up to be made more demanding and one of the things that I've found helpful that I've learned to do is just is to ask questions so instead of saying this isn't good enough I mean, I don't want to be told my work isn't good enough. I want someone asking me a question that gets me to say, oh, actually, that's not good enough mm. because it leaves my self-esteem intact. Um, and also I've then got ownership because I've talked about it. So um, one of the um, great things to have in mind is a, a thread of the quality of education for all key stages um, in the latest inspection framework from Ofsted is ambition. Yeah. So one of, the, one of the, so for a colleague who's who's in the situation is to have in mind is this really ambitious for all our students regardless of their starting points, um, and then if people say yes it is, then they need to just say what well, can you just talk me through, um, you know the justification of that I'm just trying to get my head around it. So I think quite often even if we know the answers asking the questions and saying I might have got this wrong or tell me if I've got this right so we we distance ourselves um, and talk about the material in hand uh, rather than going in guns blazing because this is sensitive work we want to bring people with us but actually if we've got a good case it eventually becomes irresistible it just it just takes time but then you're going to get movement um, which will which will have far more traction yeah, and I, and I think you, there are some things where you can, you know, you can sort of sow the seeds of like, you know, showing individuals like working one to one with people. If you're a senior leader, you can talk to a head of department and say, you know, I've, have, you, have you heard of this or have you thought about this and show them rather than if it's like structural change, like the number of periods you give a subject or something like that, it's much more difficult and you have to sort of plan that out over time. But you can certainly start nudging and by, by putting alternatives in front of people so they start seeing the difference. It's like, when you're trying to model work with kids isn't it you don't just tell them their work could be better you show them what better might look like and they can see it for themselves oh okay gosh that's there's a whole other level we can be at and uh, but again yeah the gently i i do think though there has comes a time where you do have to just sort of say look <laughs> you know and and have an honest conversation but not too soon yeah so let, let, let's go let's go into some of those ideas in the book um should we ban photocopying <laughs> you, said, you, come, you come close to that but then you say not quite what, what are you talking about there okay. um i i think it'd be healthy to move into a mindset where photocopying is rationed even if it's not really so yeah um because you know i've got to say what value is this adding to my class if i give them this so I, the, the reason I don't say completely is because I think there's some really good photocopied booklets which people yeah. departments have made which are going to kids are going to extract a lot of value from them 
I think photocopies for things like knowledge organizers. My only caveat there is there's quite a lot of knowledge organizers, beautifully crafted, great stuff in there. They're never used. They're just stuck in kids' books. Waste of time. Um, and I think extracts, you know, like that example I gave from uh, Richard Kennett's, um, you know, where he'd photocopied some extracts from Mark Morris's account of the Norman Conquest. That is worthwhile because that's got some really... Um, significant substance there that children are going to have to wrestle with intellectually so my big bugbear is is um activity type stuff which is given to children and that there's no quality assurance lens sitting behind them so it's mu as much as anything the quality of what's on that photocopying but i've yet to find a school that spends less than five thousand a year on photocopying and that's a lot of money that is a lot of money and i'm old enough and ugly enough where um to remember that i mean i did have photocopying i didn't have an interactive whiteboard that's another story who they're interactive for but anyway um but um you know i did have i did it was rationed I, and i think probably most departments are rationed but i just see an awful yeah. lot of, of wastage and i just think it's not about saving the planet important as that is it's about a lot of what we're photocopying is junk <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I, th I think that's the issue. Isn't it? It's like you, you get this sort of ad hocery and people scrapping around for things. Whereas if you're almost forced into the discipline of making a pre-prepared booklet, which is mass produced or buying a resource, you have to think in advance about what the sort of resources you need. And you end up, of course, you need to be flexible and responsive. But I, it's just when you've got when you've got the stuff ready made. God, it's so much better, isn't it? You just feel so much more at peace because you can trust the resources. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I get that. So I, 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 I'm, going to, I'm going to come back with a bit of an argument against myself, as, as it just occurred to me that I did see someone on Twitter saying the other day, they'd obviously photocopied something that uh, passed the benchmark of being worthwhile, adding value and all the rest of it. And he deliberately left, or she deliberately left a copy out because he wanted other colleagues to see it. Blow me, uh, or blow him, anyway, found that three or four people came and found him afterwards, or them afterwards, I don't know which gender it was, um, so I thought that was quite strategic and quite clever, but that would pass my benchmark because it's obviously something of significance. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, but I, th I think there's, there's something, yeah, I mean, I, I, do, I get the message there, but I think it's worth people reading that because it is quite a challenge. You know, this idea that you just have endlessly, you know, chuck stuff at kids that you just scrapped to, scrap together is not great. So look, that leads into this, uh, this um, I could almost go chapter by chapter because there's so many of them. Let, 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 you talk about stories and so on, but I think I want to I want to focus on this one, useful and beautiful. So, um, beautiful work. You talk about that when I've heard you talk. It's one of the things that you really get fired up about, and you show lots of examples of unbeautiful work, and say, "Why would you use this when you could use this?" And I, and I so visually, that's very uh, engaging. So, what, what's the message there? You know, why why does it have to look nice, or is that too simple? Yeah, so so um, this is this is um, taking the notion of from William Morris, who said we shouldn't have anything in our homes unless we know it's useful or we believe it to be beautiful. So he's not making judgments about um, about art or quality. It's it's personal to us, and um, so I think that's quite a good lens to look at the material we offer our children. So is it useful in the sense it's making them think they're going to do something with it? Is it beautiful? Not in terms of is, has it, is it covered in sparkly butterflies, but is it fit for purpose? And my concern is, is that there's too much material landing on children's desks, which is degraded in its material, in its material source. What I'm thinking of here, are dodgy line drawings, uh, cartoon characters. Um, so if I'm thinking, for instance, about, um, you know, if I'm teaching either in history or in English um, about Greek myths, and I'm, I'm teaching about, say, Demeter and Persephone, so it could happen in either of those contexts. You know, I've, I've got two alternative choices. So one is I can download something scrappy off the internet, or I can go to the British Museum where I can download artifacts, um, wonderful ceramics, wonderful art from the ancient world portraying the myth and the story of Demeter and Persephone. So I'm of the view that 
the classes in front of me deserve the best. So why would I give them junk? Yeah. But I've got to know that stuff is there. So one of the arguments I'm making is that in every single subject, there will be sources, authentic sources, related to that discipline. And I'm arguing those should be our stimulus for uh, teaching our children. And so one of the things I've, I've done um, in, in the book, and I did it in Gallimofri as well, but I've extended it slightly in, in this book, is for each national curriculum area, I have produced, or just found, I've just researched half a dozen websites of the quality, say, of the British Museum work, um, where people can go to. And I've got confidence as a teacher that those are going to be accurate, because that's, an, that's another thing, loads of stuff out there is inaccurate, um, as well as being high quality in terms of its essence. And the reason I can say that is because these resources have been produced by the academics, the experts in the field, alongside teachers quite often, certainly in the, in the British Museum one. So my children deserve that rather than, you know, scanning the horizons for, for dodgy stuff. So I think we've got to up our game and ask ourselves, is this useful and is it beautiful? Is it the best quality I can offer my children? Oh, and by the way, funnily enough, when we tap into those, it actually saves us time. So what needs to be happening in schools, bring it back to back on track, is that leaders need to make sure that colleagues have got time to know this stuff is there and to work with it and, and see how it might work in their, in their units and their schemes of work. I, I, I totally agree with that. And it, it comes back to this whole thing of um, you know, pre-planning things and, and doing that collaboratively. Sometimes what happens is you have you know, six people all teaching a similar thing, but they, they overvalue their personal autonomy. So they end up doing too much of their own thing without the core being shared. And then you end up with, I mean, I've seen this too often, you know, an NQT, uh, you know, not knowing the score, literally Googling a YouTube thing. And I'm watching a lesson where I was thinking, I teach a subject. I, why would you show that, use that? This is the kid's first and only time probably they're going to encounter this idea. And you're using that YouTube clip. It's so weird. And, and there's just a teacher on the fly panicking and out of control, really. Well, that's a dereliction of duty from that department. Yeah. And it happens too often, I'm afraid, that material is not shared. It should be an expectation that colleagues are working together. And, um, you know, lots of schools are getting this right. You know, it's not happening everywhere. But, you know, um, that is not fair on that newly qualified teacher. It's not fair on their classes either. But um, the guys who, um, who, who come to mind who, who do this uh, to the power of 10, Sean Allison's work at uh, the Darrington Research School, you know, and the way they structure their their um, dedicated time yeah. for, for subjects. It is all about what is going to be taught next and who's got the specialism on it. And, and uh, they're talking it through and identifying misconceptions. So you've got this collective understanding, which I would argue is basic quality assurance. And then there are similar processes, obviously feel slightly different in primary, um, but again, it is possible to do it so that it's not just this random stuff of people scrabbling around. I think it's shameful. It's just not fair on people. No, so we, it, I do think we need to do ourselves a favour and stop and, and, and do this. You know, collaborative work means you sacrifice a bit of absolute autonomy to share. Um, so, uh, to, to, You've still uh, got the autonomy to... of talking to the kids about this stuff, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Bring know. our personalities into it, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so um, it, tell me, uh, there's a, uh, we, we, we haven't got that much longer, but I, one of the things I'm interested in, because you... you um, you, you, you have a short section at the back about the three eyes from Ofsted. And I, and, I, and I think it's quite interesting. To be honest with you, I think we're all sort of enjoying a bit of an Ofsted lull at the moment because it's no one, people aren't sort of reacting against them. And although they're sort of, you know, getting agitated about coming back into school and doing reports, uh, saying the things that the head teachers already said. But do you think the three eyes with this whole focus on curriculum that people have been talking about, do you think it's a positive thing? Um, or do, are you trying to sort of say to people, look, own it. The, this is how, use it, but don't be a sort of, you know, afraid of it. Uh, yes, I am saying that. So I do, but I do think it's, I do think it's a really positive move. And I think it's been carefully researched. But I would also say that we're running our schools for our pupils and students, not to satisfy, you know, Ofsted inspectors coming in. Um, but I do think this thread of work um, around the quality of education is important because we know that it is one of the best bets 
for securing the strongest outcomes for all our pupils, particularly those with lower starting points or those who might be disadvantaged. Not, not the same, because we've got plenty of um, high priority donors who are also disadvantaged, but it's just, it's really inclusive. Um, it's also under, you know, it's, there's also an expectation that it's underpinned by real thought. Why are we teaching this? Why now? That is a really useful lenses. Um, for the first time in a framework, there's the importance of concepts. It comes up several times, children being taught concepts. Now, how powerful is that? That, um, you know, a child who understands a concept um, it means new information related to that concept is much stickier because the concept acts as a holding basket for lots of new ideas. This is deeply satisfying intellectually for all children, but also it's going to make them give them greater gains in their learning. So I think there's a lot in there. I think it's incredibly uh, sensible. So when it talks about assessment, you know, it's saying this is by and large formative assessment, you know, high quality conversations in lessons, checking whether children have got something or not. Um, and they make it quite clear it's not about generating masses of data. So I think it's a really grounded piece of work. And I think for those of us who, um, you know, have been thinking about the curriculum, you know, for decades, really welcome this. And the other thing I would say is just in terms of it seems to me they're drawing on sensible research, but they're also drawing on the great thinking of people like um, Christine Council and colleagues who, who have managed to frame some quite woolly ideas for which I certainly, and I think lots of other people are grateful. So the distinction, for instance, between the core and the hinterland, that's a really useful thing in terms of curricular thinking. And so I'm, I'm really pleased that um, this, I do believe it's a well thought through piece of work, but I think we've got to own it. You know, those of us working in mm. schools, those of us doing curriculum development, this is a boon to us. And so if we're gonna do this, then we've got to say what we're not gonna do quite cheerfully. Sorry, can't do that because I'm working on my novel. One of the things I, I think is a challenge in my, today, when I prepared a, a, a presentation for an event for a, a, a trust with lots of primary schools in, 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 in Norfolk. And because I can't go, I've, I just pre-recorded it and it's about primary curriculum. And, I, and I'm thinking, gosh, all these, when I'm saying geography, science, maths, history, I, I mean, every single one of you, uh, it's and there's, there's a lot of expertise in some of the curriculum work that's been done to, within a key stage one and key stage two. And I was thinking, wow, this is no mean thing. This is no small deal to get every teacher to really understand the flow of concepts across all of these disciplines. Um, it's 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 monumental, really. So, it, and, and especially if they've sort of previously been mainly focused on one particular thing, and now they have to have this sense of needing to know and understand at a broader mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. So, have you come across that 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 challenge in a primary setting? Yes, and it needs to be led carefully because when it is um, done in a way that is paced, you know, a appropriate pace, not rushed, but still keeping some mind kind of momentum, um, what, I'm, what I'm noticing is that people are getting really interested in it. Now, if you become interested in something, that creates an internal motivation to want to do more, particularly if people are not have not been overloaded with it. So for example, you know, some heads are saying, right, we want to do some wider reading around history, for instance, around, you know, the topics we're going to do. Just gathering a load of books, using a staff meeting for people to spend half an hour skimming them and uh, coming back and then chatting about what, what they think might be, be useful. And that, then fine, they, want, they all want to take them home. <laughs> that wasn't the intention, but that's what happens when people are intrinsically yeah. motivated. It starts sparking intellectual curiosity, which is very energizing. But I'm only going to do that if I'm in a setting where I'm not having to plan in triplicate for the next, you know, 10 weeks in advance and stick to it and, and marking every blimmin' book and all that sort of junk. Now, I need to be given the time to do this. Yeah, I, I think it's great when people say things like, you know, we're going to take a year, two years, you know, it's just, um, and, and everyone knows from the beginning, phew, oh, great. So yeah. let's have some miles by maybe this time we'll got there and then by then we'll have got there and everyone knows okay great this is a sensible intelligent procedure for something quite daunting yeah uh, it's not it's not get it up on the website by christmas kind of nonsense no no Look, i mean mary I, I i i'm gonna say to you that on behalf of lots of people i i, I think you're one of the <laughs> you're one of the great people in our kind of whole community uh, and uh, you do i mean every everywhere i go i am very proud to say that i i get to work with you i i, I work like a badge of honor 
because uh, you're just you inspire people you know maybe more than you even realize and i i think this book is brilliant it just it feels like hearing you talk i love it so it's like oh my god mary's coming off the page um so there's a great character and so i i just think people you know will love it and um just tell us just the details back on track when when does it come out when will people be able to get hold of the book well, it was due to be published September the 15th, but I had a lovely email from Alex Sharrett um, this morning saying that uh, it, it's come out and uh, already, so five days early, well done, John Cat. And yes, so available either from John Cat or Ye Amazoni, I think, as well. Right, right now. Okay, well, look, honestly, it's always a joy talking to you. I can't wait to, to when, we, when we meet up again and do some of our curriculum work together. But in the, in just for now, just say massive thank you on behalf of everyone and for John Cat to you and congratulations on this great book. Hope it does really well. And thank you to everyone who's uh, joined us live and who's tuning in to listen to this conversation. Um, and you know, I'm sure Mary will be glad to hear your feedback when when you get hold of the copy. Thank you, everybody, you and uh, goodbye. as well as positive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, obviously. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Tom. It's been great chatting to you. <laughs>